All right. Um, good afternoon. Um, it's lovely to be back here. Um, it's, I was here 11 years ago. I worked out at the, one of the very first um, brew cons. So a bit about me. I've been... I've worked as a firewall engineer, I built firewalls, I rolled out networks, and then I got sucked back into academia about 20 years ago. I've spent the last 20 years pretty much training the next generation of, of security people. I'm largely based in South Africa. More recently, um, I'm now based out of Norway. Um, but in between all of that, I've spent a lot of time playing with the defense sector, telecoms, finance, consultancies, etc., which has been really interesting and sort of quite a bit of a privilege being able to dip my toes back into what so-called real-world problems actually are. It also came to our realization, this is my 32nd year on the internet. Um, I've been there for a very long time. Um, I didn't quite realize it was that long. Um, I love packets. Um, if, if there's one thing that gets me excited, it's playing with packets, because applications lie. Some application's gonna tell you it's the connection's okay, the connection's not okay, but applications lie. TCP dump seldom lies. Why a shark? Well, we don't talk about why a shark and its appetite for memory. Um, so yeah, I love packets. I also love doing things on the command line. Maybe that is because I've been using Unix also for about 30 to something years. Um, and I haven't got out the bad habits of like reaching for a GUI tool or something. I just can't do it. If I need to do something, well, there's bash. There's said, there's awk. I think I've really sort of extended my viewpoint preparing this talk. I've, I've played with some new technologies like JQ and JSON. Um, but most of all, I love all things open source, but particularly open source related things to networks. Um, the background there is a tool I built with some students a few years ago based on the so-called spinning cube of doom. It's a really nice 3D tool. You feed it packets. It draws pretty pictures of what's happening um, in real time. For those of you that did take a, a gander at reading my bio and wondered what on earth Reichenology is, um, it's the study and collection of wooden woodworking planes. All right, enough about me. Why do we need to care about DNS? And I'm sure many of you have come across this haiku. It was not DNS. There's no way it was DNS. It was DNS. Um, I, it really, and this has been reinforced years of, of sort of working through and debugging and troubleshooting networks, both from an operational perspective as well as looking at some of the security aspects, is DNS is a really underloved protocol. Everyone just assumes it's there and it works. But there's a vast number of people that really don't actually understand how DNS works. And that really is the first starting point where we can depart for this talk, is DNS is critical infrastructure. When DNS breaks, all sorts of other things break. I had the talk before lunch talking about failover systems and high availability. A lot of that still today relies on um, the operation of DNS. So this is why we're looking at DNS. And if the entire takeaway, and you want to go to sleep after this slide, just take note of there. Things break badly when DNS goes wrong. So the first thing we need to do is talk about DNS resiliency. Um, it's almost a miracle that DNS, like so many of the other protocols on the internet, actually still works today. It was conceived in a galaxy long, long ago and far, far away. Um, the fact that we still have TCP that functions on multi-gigabit networks designed in the late 1970s. DNS is a little bit younger than that. But DNS resiliency really is an important part of the internet today. Everybody expects it to be there. Everything else is built on the fact that you can do something via DNS. Right the way when you go and start looking in your web browser, the very first thing it does when it loads the site, it says, Hey, is the SSL certificate? Yes, I know it's a TLS we use these days. But I was around in the days of SSL and mice that had balls in them. Um, so the very first thing your browser does is say, does the C name in the, the, the X509 certificate match the DNS name? One of the very first sort of classes of attack against encrypted communications was, hey, if we can spoof DNS, we can do whatever we want with the encrypted certificates. Or it's got a lot better, but it fell apart because there was the reliance that DNS was going to be there to save the day. The early days of, of sort of high performance networking, you looked at DNS for doing your round robin, for doing your load balancing, for doing sharing of, of work, albeit quite crudely, but it worked. There was the, the, the entire reliance was DNS would be there and would be able to catch. But so little time is spent. And if you look at, at curriculums at universities, and I'm talking sort of from undergraduate through to postgraduate level, 
in most networking curriculums, DNS is just a footnote. Hey, DNS is something that takes a, takes a human readable name and turns it into an IP address that a computer can use. And there's very seldom is there anything really much further. So there's a number of well-established practices relating to DNS. The first of these is diversification. Don't have your DNS servers for your domain on .7 and .8 within your network block. Works remarkably well, but what happens when your network block goes down? Um, the worst I've seen is don't have your two DNS servers sitting on the same hypervisor. Your hypervisor goes down, DNS breaks. So, the, the, and these recommendations are nothing new. So, uh, you should have your two DNS servers geographically separated. You should have your DNS servers on separate um, ASNs, separate IPv4 blocks. That's how you go about building resilience. And I think it's important to say that a lot of what I'm going to be talking about in the next couple of slides, there are operators out there that have implemented this kind of resilience. So this is not by no means sort of a slight against all DNS operators out there. But by the same count that there are a very small group that have implemented these kind of good protections, there's a very large group that has either ignored them completely or has no idea what's going on. And we'll look at some of those cases a little bit later on. There's the classic bind operators guide. Um, I think if a lot more people read this and understood it, um, no matter what DNS server you're actually using, the principles and the advice that are provided in the bog um, are really, really good. So at the end of the day, DNS is really important. And here, let me get the disclaimer out the way. Um, what I'm going to be talking about following on, the results are imperfect. Um, unfortunately, nobody's been kind enough to hand over the DNS records for the whole world. So I've had to effectively reverse engineer how a lot of DNS is, is actually working. So going on the basis that We've got imperfect data to start with, but doesn't mean that it's necessarily bad. It does mean that I'm painting with fairly broad strokes as it comes to the conclusions that are, um, are being arrived at. As I started going through the material and started digging, I, I got more and more scared. It's actually for something that is so critical, it's remarkably fragile when you start digging into what the actual DNS infrastructure looks like globally and at a national level. So I've taken the decision. There are no IP addresses, no specific domains um, listed here. Protect the potentially vulnerable. Um, it's probably it's good practice. The, at the same time, this is not just one snapshot in time. It's about six months total time being worked on this, and I've been taking snapshots periodically. The more worrying thing is that nothing really changes. Um, so a couple of domains have resolved in one round, some, some have not in the other round. Repainting in broad strokes, there's been no substantive change um, in the data. And then just really recognizing the flaw of the evaluation itself in terms of we had imperfect data, so we can't say that this is the fact, it is the, the definitive results. But rather, this is a case of saying, hey, this is something we need to start talking about. This is something we need to think about. Um, and then the lastly, interpretation and the views of my own. Keep everyone else happy about that. All right, so on to the far more interesting, what was the actual experiment? This actually was sparked about two years ago in the middle of COVID. I was doing some work with some final year students. We were doing an enumeration of the Norwegian top level domain, effectively looking at what is the uptake of DNSSEC. Um, the plus side, really, really good in Norway, largely because the biggest registrar turns DNSSEC on by default. And we're something like 67 or 80% for certain sectors of, of the um, domain space that we actually surveyed. But out of that came the question really of how diverse are country code top level domains? Are people registering domains outside of the .com, org, net, et cetera, are they actually paying attention to the guidelines, the recommendations that actually come about um, as regarding how we should operate DNS? What, and then from that, what is the proportion of DNS servers, say, for Belgium, that actually reside in Belgium? And I've looked at this for a number of other countries. And this was really triggered um, by what happened in February. And starting to say, well, what is DNS, we talked about it as critical infrastructure in terms of it's important for the internet to actually exist. But how does it actually go about impacting when we have a state of war, as with the, the, the conflict going on in the Ukraine? And I did some scrabbling around at that point and started trying to get together. What can I find in terms of Russian domains? And we'll talk a bit about that a little bit later on. But it, it, that sort of just started, I started chasing down the rabbit hole. And along the way, I ended up collecting a huge amount of data. So while I started off saying, well, 
where do the, the, the name servers actually lie, I ended up having a look at sort of bits of information that came out as a side effect of the crawling operations that I built. Effectively looking at how, how much is DNSSEC actually implemented and as a sort of extension to DNS that has been around for quite some time now. And then compare and contrast that with the CAA record or the certification authority record where you will talk about that a little bit later, but effectively saying these are the people that are allowed to issue certificates to me. So if we go back to the Ukrainian conflict, um, February 24th, massive sanctions come into place. One of the interesting things that came out is the Russian government said, relocate your DNS back inside Russia. There was the potential expectation of a global isolation and cutoff um, of the Russian internet, which is an interesting thing in its own right, given that Russia did exactly the same a couple of years ago. They had a, a national experiment isolating themselves from the global internet, effectively to see what broke. So while not completely driven by this, I think this is something we need to keep in the back of our mind, and we'll revisit some more recent events um, towards the end of this. So how did I go about gathering data? Um, the first trick was, where do we actually begin? This sounds like something really interesting to do, but unsurprisingly, national registrars are not exactly happy to say, hey, here's our entire zone file, have a go at it. Um, if we could do that, it would be really easy. It would have saved a lot of processing time having to reverse engineer it. Um, back in the old days of the internet, a very, very long time ago, if you wanted a zone file, you just issue an AXFO command and the name servers would happily serve a zone file up to you. That doesn't work these days, except for the Russian domain a couple of years ago. Somebody managed to do that. Um, so this whole process of going about and actually finding domain lists turned out to be a lot harder than initially expected. So I can't actually even remember all the places I gathered them from. I trawled some off GitHub. I trawled some off dumps that had been done. I found others where people had pulled lists by scraping web pages. And so this goes into where it's and clearly acknowledging that the data that we worked with is imperfect, but it's representative. At the end of the day, I've got around about 10 million domains that have been looked at. So by statistical purposes, it's significant enough to start drawing some conclusions. One of the challenges with this was trying to work out the difference. A host name is not the same as a domain name. It can be, but it isn't necessarily. And so how do we go about, when you've got lists and lists of names, how do you go about reducing them? And there's two sort of large groupings of the analysis uh, that this was broken down into based on how we go about being able to simplify these lists. Um, the country code top-level domains have some very, very different ways of approaching things. Um, th three of the examples that we look at are the ZA domain for South Africa, AU for Australia, and UK. They have a very clearly structured second level um, within the country code domains, whereas countries like Russia, Belgium, Norway, they don't. It's a pretty much a free-for-all. Everything's very much flat under the, say, for example, um, .no. What was interesting is pretty much across the board, as I went through iterating through, it was around about 8% of the queries would come back reliably saying NX domain, no such domain. In other words, the domain had expired. And this is not unexpected. It just shows that there is a, a churn um, of domains. Overall, less than 1% of domains existed, but were either timing out or refused after a couple of runs. And this was an important thing as well, as one can't just take one snapshot. You don't know what else is happening out on the internet. So you need to take, if something fails, you put it in another list and you retry it sometime later on. But effectively, have run this over a couple of months and have largely aver averaged and aggregated out um, the data. So what did we actually look for? So we looked at a couple of country domains. As I said, the Norway, Belgium, and Russia as just a selection of domains. Belgium, because we're here, Norway, because I live there, and Russia, hey, well, it's an interesting domain to look at at the time. Comparing and contrasting that with some of the others, um, and these are largely chosen because they are that much more structured in terms of their second level ordering. The UK, we used co.uk. Um, Australia, com.au, and South Africa, co.za, um, just because they were large pools, but still manageable. Um, when one starts looking at the whole of the UK domain, it actually gets really big. I think the UK, the code at UK was about four and a half million domains. I started off with about 18 million host names that needed to get parsed down through that. And then I complemented this with the so-called majestic million, the, so the 
so-called top million domain names on the internet, um, and that's a fairly scary set of um, findings in its own right. But some of the interesting things that came up with the processing is the number of timeouts, very surprising, the number of RFC 1918 addresses that were exposed in the global internet when you start digging through who are name servers. Um, this just shouldn't be happening these days. Um, people have known about this for years, but it was an interesting thing, and largely those correlate quite nicely to why domains were actually timing out. And then overall refuse connections was really, really small once I actually factored it all out. So to put some numbers to it, this is around about 10 million domains that we actually looked at. Um, broken down there. Russia is by far the smallest. The Russian list, I had a huge number of domains. However, they, that it stood out in terms of there being a very large number of them that either just timed out or refused connections. But most of the Russian collection actually only happened from June onwards. So once sort of sanctions had, and things had really escalated there. So a couple of caveats we need to bear in mind. This data is volatile. If you do a collection now, you do a collection next week, you're probably going to get different answers because people update domains, people, um, infrastructure goes up, down, etc. And Through the process of this, I actually just kept falling deeper and deeper into this rabbit hole. I've ended up with far more data than I could actually talk about in a week standing up and, and exploring it. So it's been a lot of it is about how to go about sort of condensing this down. And to sort of sum it up, we looked at 10 million domain names which span around 320,000 um, individual dom domain name servers or DNS servers. And so the question is, well, there's statistics. And so we'll flag the, the quote that's attributed to Mark Twain. There's three kinds of statistics, lies, damn lies, and statistics. And to make it even worse, the same quote is actually generally attributed to Benjamin Disraeli as well, also saying lies, damn lies, and statistics. So is it really a lie? But just bear in mind that this is you can dress statistics up to be whatever you actually want. And that's really the, the gist of the quote. So the question really is about data quality. Just because we don't have perfect data, is this not worth looking at? What conclusions can we actually draw from it? And really, is incomplete data bad data? And how does it compare to no data at all? And then the second one is the, is the approach I took, saying there's nothing out there. I have spent a long time searching sort of Industry talks like this, I've spent time trawling through academic journals and conferences. No one's done this kind of large-scale survey. Um, and so I'm going with the approach of incomplete data is better than no data at all. So how did I go about doing the processing? A lot of it boiled down to cleaning, 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 and more cleaning. And any of you that have worked with any kind of real-world data are probably painfully aware that real-world data is never what it actually looks to be in terms of there's always a weird letter, there's a weird character, there's some separator like a semicolon. You're quite surprising. Semicolon is not a valid character in a domain name, yet there were hosts returned that had a semicolon in the middle of their host name. Don't ask me how that happened, but they're there. It doesn't factor, and of course, when you're splitting and breaking data based on those kind of field separators, things go badly wrong. So my first approach is this is gonna be easy. I'll whip out bash, bash for loop, had a list of domains, and I fired it away. Well, it took about three days to do one set of queries on 600,000 domains. This wasn't going to work very well when I needed to do a lot of these. So I reluctantly went and I tried some Python. Python was a lot better. It was 18 hours, but this felt very much like I was trying to reinvent a wheel. And that's where I sort of remembered a long time ago, ZDNS, put together by the same team that produced ZMAP, Amazingly fast scanner, ZDNS does pretty much the same kind of things. It's written in Go, very, very fast, massively multi-threaded um, solution for doing DNS queries. First attempt, got about 38 minutes for 600,000 domains, moved on, then about 42 minutes for a million domains, 12 minutes for a million domains, doing sort of the, um, the DNS set queries, and about 30 minutes per million domains for doing CAA queries. I think I could run it at least 10 times faster still, provided I build out infrastructure. Um, what I was trying to avoid doing was having to build my entire own sort of parallel DNS resolution infrastructure, but rather to try and do it in such a way that it was also being very nice. Again, being painfully aware, I'm querying public servers. How do I do it in such a way as to not have any kind of negative impact? 
So I took a lot of guidelines from some of the stuff that Google's published for their public DNS, generally kept query levels well below about 1,500 queries per second. What did make a difference was running some of my own caching infrastructure, um, spun up some VPS hosts, and getting some decent-sized caches in place, and structuring the queries made things go a lot faster. If you've just asked for the NS records for a host, all that stuff sitting in memory, you may as well go and while it's in memory, go and ask the other questions you want to know about that domain. It's going to save a whole number of lookups. And doing those kind of things resulted in some fairly substantial speedups. Some of the challenges, though. Um, again, the raw input data not particularly clear. Um, we had expired domains, upstream, upstream connectivity problems, timeouts, um, configuration errors I've mentioned already. And we needed to go through, as we're doing this, keep a record of what succeeded and what didn't succeed. And it was around about this time, and with the transition to, to ZDNS, which outputs in a plain text format, but structured text, in, excuse me, in terms of being JSON, it made this a whole lot easier to actually go about doing. And so it's worth mentioning what some of the tools were. Well, Bash was the powerhouse. Um, Bin SH, if I was running on some of the other machines, um, said orc, all the common Unix command line tools. Why? They're designed to work with data. They're designed to work with plain textual data. They're possibly not the fastest, but they were the fastest in terms of development. JQ, a lot of credit needs to go to that, being able to parse and work with the, the JSON files. ZDNS for doing the resolution. Netcat was used for some various bits of testing, as well as for sort of building some raw queries for doing whois, um, for doing some of the enrichment data. Um, for that, particularly used the Whois service by, from Team Simru. I'm sure most of you are aware of that. And then the ever-present MaxMind geolocation systems. Um, so used both of those for validating AS numbers as well as sort of the country-level geolocation. And then, much to my shame, I ended up having to use some spreadsheets just because I wanted to make sure I'd added things up properly. Um, sometimes, all can said, get a little bit confused about what's actually going on. But all was good. So the approach taken was largely iterative, going collect as much data as possible within reason, bearing in mind I could, we could ask hundreds of queries, but how do you do it in such a way that you're not creating a negative impact on the rest of, of the ecosystem? Um, batch collection helps with the caching. Scalability, how do we do it? You run it on multiple systems. A lot of this was also run from multiple points. When I reran, I didn't always rerun from the same IP address. And there is some obvious skew that comes in place there where you have got large providers that are providing some kind of geolocated um, responses back. But they seem to be very much in the minimal. I worked in about a 72-hour retry window for each run. So I'd do the first run, and within 72 hours, I would have done subsequent runs through retrying anything that timed out, refused, or issued with um, server errors. Mo the move to JSON, while very good, also resulted in a massive problem. I now had very, very big files. And some of the runs were coming back with sort of more than 10 gigs in size because JSON is quite a chatty protocol. Uh, and ZDNS is very kindly dumps a whole bunch of other information into the, into the responses you didn't even ask for, like TTL values, SOA, re record numbers, et cetera, which in hindsight was actually really nice to have. And that actually opens up an entire, now that I've got all this data, I can go do another bunch of run through looking at that. But it took a while to actually go about running through this. Fortunately, JQ is really fast. Um, and on a modern machine with a little bit of tuning and some pre-filtering, you're looking at probably 10 to 15 minutes for a script to run through and process the resulting JSON files. So maybe looking to the future, maybe I need to bend over and decide that actually this is not something I should be doing with a collection of shell scripts, but a relational database actually is probably the better way to go with it. And so moving now into sort of the, the results section. Act one, what is the current state of affairs as it comes to security protocols within DNS? The oldest of these, obviously, is DNSSEC. Um, draw your attention to the quote that was made popular um, by Ronald Reagan of Trust But Verify, which apparently is a direct translation of a Russian quote that he was, work or Russian proverb he was working with um, during the, the negotiations around sort of strategic nuclear uh, proliferation and sort of managing nukes, etc., during the height of the Cold War. But what DNSSEC does is it provides us with strong cryptography. It provides us with a cryptographic method that allows for the authentication of DNS data. 
authenticated denial of existence. We can categorically say, this does not exist. If only people actually went around using it. Um, it's a really sad state of affairs. Um, if we think back to the birth of DNSSEC in 1999, um, I'm hesitant to ask, but how many people were around in 1999? Um, so DNSSEC may well be older than a fair number of people in the audience. Um, 2013 was sort of the, the heyday of DNSSEC in terms of, at that point, more than 100 of the country code TLDs, all the top-level TLDs had actually been signed, had a DNSSEC route, um, and the decision was made by ICANN that any future domains would be mandated to be signed. So we're nearly 10 years on from there. Why are most places still not actually using it? Um, fortunately, I'm not the only one that's thought about this. There's quite a bit of work, Chung and Roth, in 2017, 2019, um, did some work looking at comnet, org, the .nl domain, the .se domain. Well done to the Netherlands and Sweden. Congratulations, you are actually among the top um, things. I've just got a, I've got a paper coming out later in the year where we detail Norway, and Norway is sitting at about 65% um, as well now. But these are very much the, the sort of the exception. When we actually look at the results coming in from the scrape data from this study, it's not a particularly pretty affair. 0.3% of the top million domains are using DNSSEC. Now, surely if you're involved in e-commerce and all the rest, you want trust and credibility, why are you not using this? Com.au, 0.35%. Co.uk coming in in second place at 2%. Belgium, well done, 27%. Um, it's not great, but it's a hell of a lot better than most of the rest of the world. Um, South Africa, 0.1%. Not great at all. So, um, we could do a talk entirely around DNSSEC and the fun and games and stuff, but the question is, why do people not go about implementing it? It's largely seen as a chicken and egg scenario. Why should I go about implementing DNSSEC when no clients out there go about validating it? Um, it's one of the things, every time I travel and sort of wherever you Try and have a look. Are you at a resolver, a DNS resolver, that actually validates DNSSEC? I've yet to actually find one out in the wild that, that validates. Um, so the next thing we looked at is a relatively new record, which is the CAA record. And this is a new record that has been proposed and adopted, and it allows you to make an explicit statement in your domain zone file. It says, I trust these certificate authorities. I hereby endorse that they are able and permitted to go about issuing cryptographic certificates for my domain. It's amazing how the zone file has become overloaded as a, as a trust point. You use it for validating Google, for out to your Office 365, or all these other things, SPF and all the rest, we shove into text records along. CNA, CAA is a sort of a variation on this. It's a relatively new domain, really only adopted around about 2019. Um, the idea behind this is by being explicit as to which certificate authorities can issue you certificates, it should hopefully help cut down on fraudulent certificates being issued, particularly with the advent of many of the so-called free, free domain. Um, Let's Encrypt makes use of it. Most of the other big ones make encrypt it. Zero Trust makes use of it. Um, Zero SSL. Um, some of them won't actually issue certificates unless you've got um, the appropriate records in place. So looking at, again, the top... Top, what are the top 10 entries for issuance out of the magic million? Um, let's encrypt, no surprise, that you can't really beat the price of free. Um, but this also provides some insight, saying that, you know, here's your 50,000 euro guarantee if you get hacked. Maybe that isn't so important to companies, um, bearing in mind that these top million, in theory, represent a large portion um, of e-commerce. Breaking it down a little bit further, of the um, majestic um, million, the top 12 domains here accounted for 93% of the records. Um, but the important thing to notice here is it's not a million records. Um, as we'll see in the next slide, only about 3% of the domains in the magic million actually listed this. These happen to be a breakdown of the sort of 115,000 entries. In many cases, the domains that did have them had multiple. They would allow Let's Encrypt and Komodo and Amazon and Global Sign or whoever else it might actually be. The adoption rates, well, 3.7% is not that bad, I suppose. Um, it's certainly higher than any of the others. And 
Again, welcome to Belgium. Thank you, Belgium. Well done. Um, one percent of your domains are actually implementing this. Is it a good thing? Is it a bad thing? I don't know yet. It's a question, again, looking around. No one's really done much work on this. Um, I found one study done in late 2019 that looked at the, um, the, what at that stage was the Alexa top one million, and it had around about the same kind of results as Majestic. Um, so maybe things haven't really um, moved on. And so with those two sort of side little projects out the way, which were largely stumbled across because the data was there already, getting to the, the core of the actual research and the, the, the core of really what I want to talk about today is, do we know where our DNS is? It's 2 a.m. Do you know who actually controls your DNS? Do you have any idea what nation state feels like ruining your day? Um, because we don't know what's going to happen. So the real question here is around finding value. Um, the data set I checked it this morning is sitting around about 36 gigs compressed. So it's a fair chunk of data. I admit it's probably not stored in the most efficient way with JSON, but there's a lot of data there. And what I've looked at here really only just starts scraping the surface. Um, and bearing in mind the, the wise words of Donald Knuth, um, prem premature optimization is the root of all evil. I've tried really, really hard to stay away from falling into the various rabbit holes no matter how exciting they actually look. Um, what I can say in terms of the summary to this is of all the domains surveyed, all of them are at significant risk of having a foreign player being able to have impact the domain. And we'll look at the degree that is. Um, something interesting that I came across, and I know there's a number of people that do threat modeling, and it's your passion. Um, I haven't come across a threat model or a set of guidelines for threat modeling um, DNS. So if we look through the six um, sort of domains we mentioned earlier, starting with Australia. Now, Australia is really interesting. It's an island. It's the world's biggest island. They call themselves a continent, but they're an island. Um, but part of that is that they, yes, they've got really good connectivity, but they are an island. Um, what happens is submarine cables to Australia are actually damaged um, by an earthquake, as we saw um, happening to some of the sort of the Pacific nations earlier in the year when the volcano blew up there, or via malicious act. 63% of the name servers, this is not domains, of the name servers used for Australian domains are hosted in the US. In fact, 67% of them are in North America. That's basically Canada and the US. 7% are in Western Europe. Um, Australia is actually not doing too badly. 20% of the name servers that are used by its domains are actually located in Australia. And the big asterisk that, of course, sits with this is, well, geolocation is an in imprecise science. Noted, but what I pull these stats, I use two independent systems, the Team Simru as well as the, um, from MaxMind, and as well as, in certain cases, doing some checks against the allocation of IP address ranges from the regional internet registries like APNIC, RIPE, ARIN, um, etc. Australia, not too bad. In total, 26,000 name servers um, control the Australian namespace. The top 10 makes up 94% of those. South Africa, 18,000 odd name servers. Um, South Africa is not doing too bad. 14% of name servers are located in South Africa. South Africa also has a really interesting term, sort of topology in terms of connecting to the internet. There are two or two and a half um, submarine cables, one, one set running up the west coast, one running up the east coast. And we've had times in the past where due to issues, it has ended up cutting out um, large portions of the internet. But coming back here, 63% in North America, 19% in Western Europe. Having a look over here, 55 were in China, 56 in Russia. Probably not too much of a concern for South Africa, given that they're a member of, of the BRICS um, grouping. Um, looking at neighboring countries, less than 10 servers actually are Botswana, Malawi, Zimbabwe, Lesotho. Um, so not much geographic diversity here as well. So I would say, forget nation states aside, just from a geographic perspective, there's risk here. What happens when your submarine cables get cut? you're going to be looking at about 70-odd percent of the domains cannot actually even be resolved. UK was the largest of the domains that we looked at. This is the co.uk domain. About 4.5 million domains in total were looked at, producing 68,000 
um, name servers. They also control, and by they I talk about the nation state, Great Britain, 20% of the name servers are actually nominally located inside the borders of Great Britain. No surprise, 40% to the US, 43% um, overall to North America, 23% in Western Europe. NATO, all members of NATO, of NATO, so NATO allies, unlikely to probably go about turning things upside down. If we look at sort of the geopolitics currently, China's got 142, Russia nearly 300, Iran 54. Um, what could the potential impact of those actually be? Um, is, and this is probably a, a reasonable point to raise it, is are national regulators actually looking where the domains for critical infrastructure are located? Are there, is there a mandate anywhere to say that we deem this to be critical infrastructure, you need to use name servers inside the country. Um, we prefer you not to have name servers hosted in a country that we have, let's just say, it's complicated diplomatic relationships with. Belgium, 32,000 name servers. Only 4% of name servers are actually located in Belgium. Um, probably not too much of a problem. 47% of them, again, Western Europe, or if you look at the countries, they're NATO countries. There's unlikely to be too much friction um, in, the, in the immediate future. But when we look, China's got 104, Russia 186, Iran 8, and BY, anybody remember your two-letter domains? Belarus, they've got five um, as well. Norway, um, same kinds of things, 56% in North America, 20% in Scandinavia, 29% in Western Europe. So we can say roughly 59 or 49% are in safe countries. Um, and it's, one can go on and have a look again, presence of China, Russia, um, and Iran. Russian Federation, now this is where there's a big star attached to, and to, to take note. This is by far the smallest sample. I was only able to get around 230,000 domains um, resolving reliably. I've got more sometimes, less sometimes, but on, on the whole around 230,000 domains. I do have an input list of 2.9 million domains for this. So that, that effectively tells you what portion, about 10% of what I started with was actually resolving. Being small, Compared to the others, statistically, probably the results are not as significant. But this is the state of affairs as of August. 45% um, of the name servers are actually located in Russia. Um, 40, are in 40 servers are in China, sorry, 49 servers are in China, 40 in Belarus. Ukraine has 223 name servers, which serve around about 8,000 domains. Um, draw your own conclusions from there. Interestingly, 49% in total of Russia's of name servers serving those 230,000 domains are located in Western Europe. Um, so far, we've seen nothing in terms of sanctions saying that, hey, you shouldn't be doing this. Is it something down the pipeline? I don't know what the politicians might come up with um, in months to come. And then really to round it off, the Majestic Million represents roughly 200 countries. 40% of the name servers are sitting in the US. Germany comes in second at 10,000 10, name servers, or 7%, and it drops off um, there. Of these, the top 10 only make up 73%, so a big difference to what we've seen elsewhere. And so with the raw numbers out the way, and numbers are there because peop some people like numbers, we can actually start talking about what are the, what are the takeaways from this. Um, And we can say, well, what is the impact, the reflection? Is it the end of the world? Should we all just like become wasteland warriors? You know, Mad Max was our gu style guide for what we're actually going to get up to. Impact number one, and there's five major impacts to take away from this, is an attack on 20 IP addresses can potentially take out 75% of the Norwegian domain space. 20 IP addresses, and they are not trivial or well, sorry, it is rather trivial to actually go about determining what these actually are. And to, we can't have a security presentation, of course, without quoting Sun Tzu, and being able to say the supreme art of war is to subdue the enemy without fighting. Think about where we are today. If you can take out a nation's actual infrastructure without firing a shot, um, you've, you've pretty much won. Massive denial of service attacks, 
They're cheap these days. You can rent, rent a botnet. If you've got a nation state, you can cook your own botnet up um, and then say we can either confirm or deny. But this was a fairly scary fact to me, is that around 75% of Norwegian domains could be taken out fairly easily. If we look at the UK, an attack on the top five providers renders 10% of the co.uk domain um, unworkable. It's about 440,000 domains um, under co.uk. It's a lot less. It's only 10%. Um, I haven't gone going to sort of protect the potentially vulnerable. What are the domains that fall into this category? Again, it's not difficult to go about determining, uh, but build your own scraper. Um, impact number three, attack on the top five providers for Belgium can render 20% of the, of the domains unreachable. Um, so again, it's nothing special. It just shows you're vulnerable. For all the other good things the Belgian domain space is doing, it's still vulnerable to this. Um, and if we go back to a quote that Dan Kaminsky made back oh, 11 odd years ago, talking about some of the major flaws he found in DNS at that time, he said, the data shows that this is most likely a hundreds of thousands to millions of victims issue. And I believe that exactly the same applies with what kind of stuff we're talking about here. If you can take over or, or attack an, a nation state's DNS as critical infrastructure, it is going to have a knock-on effect into the millions. So what is the big picture behind this? Impact number four. Big DNS providers know what they're doing. They're resilient. They've got multi-homing multiple IP addresses, geographically distant, they make up a very, very small proportion of the total. Um, the smaller providers often don't. The smaller providers are the ones that are listing RFC 1918 addresses as their publicly accessible name servers. No wonder things don't actually work. Um, impact five. Um, there's some, IP, some portions of IP, IPv4 address space that need to be considered to be a lot more important than others. Um, and yes, IPv6 is out there, believe it or not, some people actually do use IPv6, but given that most of the stuff that I saw did not support IPv6, I ended up just culling that out of, of what I'm doing. One of the big challenges with this is coming back to the, the core around resiliency for, for DNS is we say we've got high availability, we can just move a server that's fine, and we can move brucon.org, can get moved anywhere else, we just have to update DNS um, to point to the new IP address. It's not that easy when you have to start moving your domain name servers around. That in itself is a risky process um, and creates things. So with apologies to George Orwell and his two pigs, um, all IP addresses are equal, but some are more equal than others. Um, and if you haven't read Animal Farm, it's one of those really good recommended readings, probably even before you get to reading The Art of War. So what is the impact? We're looking here in the red spot, where we have an opportunity for a threat, a threat against an asset, and there's a vulnerability. That is ultimately what we need to start thinking about. What is the impact? And I'll be the first one to say I don't have any hard and fast answers, other than maybe we should start talking about this as a potential threat. Ultimately, a relatively small number of servers can result in a large-scale impact. Think of this as asymmetric warfare. Why take out thousands of systems when you maybe take out two or 300 core systems around the world and do a significant amount of damage crippling the internet? Um, what is the risk of foreign hosted systems? Um, is, this, is this actually something significant? Am I actually just being a, a someone who worries with, with no apparent reason? I don't know. This is, and uh, again, this is about starting a conversation. Should we regard DNS servers as critical infrastructure? Are some domains more important than others? And one of the things I've done is, started, is I've started pulling out government domains I could tie to governments. Um, they were a little bit better off, but not that much better off. Um, there were still some government domains for some countries located in some very odd places um, in terms of their name servers. Not necessarily a primary name server, but one of the name servers was there. Um, what's the impact of having foreign hosted domains? Yes, it might be cheap, and here I'm pointing a big finger at the US. They have some of the cheapest hosting anywhere for a variety of historical reasons. Um, and then probably the, the, one of the more scary questions, do we know what we don't know? Um, and I would hesitate, I would sort of warrant to say that I don't think we, don't know, we know what we don't know about what the risks are. Um, and again, waving and putting a call out is 
is anybody aware of, of specific guides for threat modeling around DNS? And then really just to tie it into sort of the things that have happened in the last couple of days, I am pretty sure someone theorized about the, the issues of a leak on, on the, the gas pipelines. But what happens when the unexpected actually happens? Um, what happens when it occurs? How do we prepare for it? And we're sort of not looking at any issues around attribution or anything, but how do we prepare for these types of things? And really, the devil is in the details. Um, found a really nice quote here from Dan Farmer. Um, some of you might be too young to remember Dan Farmer. Some of you might have very fond memories of his tool, Satan, uh, one of the first real security scanners out there. And if you didn't like the name, it came with a command that you could run it, called, renamed itself as Santa. Um, but one of the first real sort of vulnerability scanners out there. Dan said, I was interested in the implements of mass destruction from an academic point of view. Um, and that, to some extent, is what, is what I've been looking at here. It's ultimately, it's a complex problem. Um, DNS is amazing. It's still amazing that we've got a technology that, that is that old that works reliably. Um, it's still surprisingly poorly understood, even when you talk to people at ISPs, network providers, things like that. Um, it's one of those things, nobody cares about it when it works. I'm sure many of you work as network administrators or systems administrators. Nobody really cares when the network works. When things break, everyone comes running and says, well, why aren't you doing your job? Um, it's pretty much the same with DNS. It's not a problem until it's not working, in which case it's a really big problem. Um, in terms of the technology, DNS, arguably the world's most fantastic, completely distributed data store. It's dynamic as well. It's constantly updating. And it works with all technology. It's amazing. Um, but the distributed nature of it, of the very sort of distributed nature of it, also makes it difficult to create momentum around getting changes put in place. How do we care for this big, massive global system? How do we coordinate things? How do we build competency in it? One of the arguments being that, you know, how do we build, change things? Well, we've got RFCs. We publish them. Obviously, obviously people must do comply with them. Except they don't. We've got that evidence. If we just look at something like DNSSEC, people aren't complying with it. If we look at the, some of the core basic um, principles around DNS that have been around since the 80s, don't use private address ranges for your public DNS servers, and people are still going about doing that. Um, the question, another question to come out of this is, are all domains, and maybe some subdomains, are they all equally important? Or can we start actually as part of a discussion around critical infrastructure and national security, start saying, these domains actually are more important than the others. How about we go about having a more detailed look at them and saying, well, what is the risk evaluation around them? And ultimately, what happens if DNS is compromised? Because it's not just an on or off situation. DNS forms the backbone for so much that, that we actually take for granted today in terms of how we broker trust on our networks. So, so what? And really, this is, this is where I don't actually have some answers. Um, questions, is this really a problem? Or am I sort of seeing the proverbial boogeyman in the night that's coming out to scare things? How bad is it? I would say it's the, the initial work that I've done says it's something that I personally think is, is worth digging into more. Is it really bad? Probably not that bad. But again, I'm a pessimist where the glass is cracked, all the beer is leaking out rapidly. Um, it's not a, oh, I've still got half a beer despite it being cracked. That's just, that's just not me. So how do we make it better? Um, discussions with national certs, uh, national registrars, creating awareness. And that really is probably the single goal I had in, in terms of proposing this talk, um, other than, of course, to come back to BrewCon, which is wonderful. But to start, start the conversation, make people aware of these things. Are they things that people have thought about? Um, ultimately, a lot of longer-term monitoring is needed. Um, but at the end of the day, I've actually been left myself with a far bigger pile of questions, a long, long list of questions, far more so than the fairly simplistic list that I actually started with. And with that is the end. Um, I hope you found it interesting. I think we've got some time for a question or two. Um, if you're interested, come say hello afterwards, especially if you are in a national cert or registrar or security researcher, I'd love to have a chat. Um, out of some of the preliminary work, I'm already chatting to one of the national registrars um, around at least sharing some of the methodology um, for them to be able to do some of their own auditing. All right, thank you very much.
Thank you, Barry. Hello. Thank you, Barry. Um, so if there's any questions, I see a hand. Yeah, no, thank you, Barry. A very nice presentation. Um, some uh, things came to my mind when I saw your uh, tables with figures. For example, the US frequently comes forward again in the, the first or the second. Did you look at why this was? I would assume maybe, and I hope you can confirm or uh, say it's not true, that because many of the cloud providers are in the US. Cloud providers is one. Yeah. The other is a lot of the cheap DNS hosting providers, yeah. are they? Um, so. I think in both, both those cases, one can say it's possibly an economic incentive. That said, the cloud providers have cloud address space elsewhere through the world, which is in most cases correctly registered by geolocation. But uh, you raise a very valid point there. Yeah. And, and then as a follow-up, because I'm from Belgium, the, the number of the CAA record uh, stood out, 20-something percent. Did you look at why that was? I haven't yet. It's sort of part of a larger... Um, project I'm actually involved yeah. in in terms of trying to look, not in terms of only what the records are, but what the, the detailed contents are. Again, one of the things that stood out looking at not just Belgium, but all the CIA records was the amount of garbage in there. Um, things that just make absolutely no sense in terms of the specifications. Um, there were like Google, the Google domain ID keys in there. There was, I saw a Microsoft key, I saw SPF records. Um, it's, it's weird, but it is part of what I want to look at going forward. There's some other really interesting um, work being done by some other researchers at the moment saying that actually publishing a CAA record is not necessarily good for your domain, um, particularly if you're using some of the sort of some providers like Let's Encrypt, um, and you link this into the whole sort of certificate trust architecture, there's some good anecdotal evidence that say, for example, you spin up a, a new website, you put a default WordPress install in, but don't configure it, you then register a certificate, and it's all being monitored on the certificate transparency lists. There's some good anecdotal evidence that you might well find your site is compromised before you even get back to do the configuring. Um, that's, again, something I'm playing with at the moment. Hi, um, thanks for the presentation. Actually, I don't, I don't have any questions. I just have a piece of information that might be useful for you. Um, in Spain, so the .es domains, you can actually go to the government and request a full list of all the existing .es domains. I did not know that. Thank you. Yeah, so <laughs> that might give e you... ES you know, didn't work because I couldn't find an easily available list. So you can get a full list, you know, up to date for today with all Super. the domains. Super, I will follow uh, that up. Yeah, I can, I can give you, you know, info how to do that. You Perfect. need to request, say why you're doing that, and they will give it to you, hopefully. So, they have given it to me. amazing. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I don't know if there's any other questions. Yeah, thank you. Um, so I was wondering if you have taken into account uh, or if any of these domains that you found are known or potentially malicious. I haven't done that cross check yet. Because that's um, something. It is something to do in terms of pulling, running against something like the VT, the VT API. Um, I got sort of pretty bogged down in, in just crunching through the data, but it is a almost redo the study just looking at malicious domains, I think would be a, a really interesting thing to do. Thanks for the suggestion. All right, I don't see any other hands, so I think I'm going to say cheers. If you want to chat to me, um, I'd be love, it, love to chat to you after it, but I think our next speaker needs to get all their toys plugged in uh, before they talk. So thank you very much. I will be around today and tomorrow. <laughs>